Well, um, how do you make important decisions? Uh, I, there, there's lots of different ways that it, through life you have probably gotten to a tipping point where you know you had to make a decision are you going to accept the job are you going to say no and stay where you are or are you going to move are you going to sell the house and move are you going to keep the house or are you going to downsize are you going to stay or what are you going to do what are you going to do in a marriage where maybe things are getting difficult and you're kind of at that tipping point in your marriage how do you make important decisions lots of people have different ways of doing it obviously you want to seek wise counsel and try to get all the input you can get and if you're a person of faith you might pray and try to determine what would God have you do in this difficult situation? And there, there are circumstances and situations we come to in life where we reach this tipping point. A decision has got to be made. We're going to go one way or the other. And what is it that is going to help us define the decision? What are we going to do to help us make this decision? Some of you may be at those places in your life right now. You may find yourself at a tipping point in your career, in your marriage, in your finances. You may be at a place right now where you are facing a very difficult decision. And, and there's no obvious right or wrong answer. Like there, there, there are two answers and maybe they're both equally good or, or maybe there's good and bad about both of them, but you just aren't sure what to do. I mean, it's, it's one thing if one is obviously right and one is obviously wrong. That wouldn't necessarily be a difficult decision, but what do you do when the decision is so difficult because the answer isn't always clear? As Jesus made his way to Jerusalem, the religious leaders were really at a tipping point. They were really having to decide, what are we going to do with this guy named Jesus who is coming and claiming to be the Messiah? That, that he is coming into town and he, he's come in as this king, he's cleansed the temple and kicked out all, the, all the, uh, the people who were selling the sacrifices in the temple. He's claiming to be the Messiah. And if we, if we say, yes, he is the Messiah, well, then we could get in trouble with Rome, right? Because the Roman Empire was actually ruling over Israel at the time. And they didn't want any king but Caesar. So, thought, you know, if, if, this guy, if this guy's a fraud, then we risk our power. We risk the little bit of political power we have from Rome. We put that all at risk. But, but on the other hand, if he actually is who he claimed to be, then maybe this is the long-appointed king that we've been waiting for. Maybe this is the guy, and we, we just don't know. On the other hand, the religious leaders also had the popularity, the popularity and the respect of the, the people in Israel to think about. They, they really wanted to be respected by the Israelites. They wanted to be seen as the authority, as the, the rulers. And so, at the one hand, Jesus is coming in, and all the people are starting to follow him, and they're beginning to realize, hey, everybody's following Jesus, and Nobody's really listening to us, the religious leaders, anymore. So, again, they were faced with this tipping point of what are we going to do about Jesus? How are we going to, how are we going to wrestle with this idea of who he is and who he claimed to be? The decisions we face in life sometimes don't seem as maybe as, as momentous as what the Pharisees faced in their day. But every decision we face actually comes to the same tipping point of who is it that is in charge of your life? Who, who is it that you worship? Who is it that you claim as Lord of your life? Who is it that you recognize as the ultimate authority over everything? Your money, your finances, your relationship. Who is it that ultimately has authority over your life? The tipping points we face in our day-to-day -day decisions aren't really all that different from the decisions that they faced back then. Jesus had brought these religious leaders to a, to a tipping point in their life. They had to choose between their temporary power that they had been given by Rome or following after Jesus for their eternal security. They, had to, they were faced with a choice between earthly masters, the Roman, the Roman government, or between their heavenly father. And ultimately, they had to make a choice, not just between whether they were gonna follow Jesus or not, but they had to make a choice between life and death. They had to make a choice between life and you think, well, that's an easy choice. You choose life. The problem is, I'm not sure that the Pharisees in their day understood and recognized what it meant to choose life. And I'm not so sure that you and I fully understand and recognize that in the decisions we make each and every day, we are often making choices between life and death as well. We are choosing between what is temporary and what is eternal. We are choosing between earthly masters and our heavenly father. So in this particular encounter that I want to look at today in Luke chapter 20, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open with me. We're going to see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, are going to come to Jesus 
And they're going to pose two very difficult questions to Jesus as they're trying to make up in their mind. Is this guy the Messiah or not? They're going to pose a political question to Jesus, and they're going to pose a religious question to Jesus. And in both questions, they're really trying to trap him. They're really trying to corner God, and and they're trying to get out of Jesus what they want out of Jesus. They've really already made up their mind. They're just trying to get Jesus to agree with them. I know nobody in this room has ever done that, where you've already made up your mind and you've just tried to get God to agree with you. But that's exactly what the religious leaders in this day were doing. So we're going to see these two questions, a political question and a religious question. And then Jesus is going to turn and ask them a question that they can't answer. And in all of these questions... We're going to see three options that we have every single day of our lives. And then I'm going to leave you with three questions that you can ask when you're facing a difficult decision and how these three questions might help you make that decision. So let's look together. Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on Jesus. Now remember, they're after Jesus because Jesus came into town He went into the temple. He overturned all the tables where they were selling the sacrifices. He really upset the religious establishment of his day. They're asking, who gave you the right, Jesus, to come in here and do this? We're the people with authority, not you. Who gave you the right to do this? So they're always trying to find, they're trying to find a way to lay hands on him. But they feared the people. Because remember, they're threading a, a really difficult needle here. They've got the Roman government on one side that that gives them the little bit of power and authority they have and they've got the people on the other side the people are all interested in jesus they believe jesus they like jesus jesus is feeding the hungry he's raising the dead he's restoring sight to the blind so the religious leaders are, are are really in a difficult position but they feared the people so they watched jesus and they sent spies who pretended to be sincere so we already know these questions they're about to ask are not sincere questions that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and to the jurisdiction of the governor. In other words, they did not have the authority to get rid of Jesus. They needed the Roman government to get rid of Jesus for them. So they set up these traps, these questions that they were asking Jesus in order to trap Jesus so that they could get him to say the wrong thing and then turn him over to the, to the Roman authorities to have him executed. So they asked him, teacher, we, do not, uh, we know that you speak the truth uh, and you teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? So this is a, this is a tricky question because the Roman government had come in and had said all of the people of, of Israel were supposed to pay a, a, a tax to Caesar. And the Israelites hated this because this showed that the Romans were over them. They had authority over them. They didn't think it was right. So there were many among them, many religious zealots among them who said, we're not paying taxes to Caesar. That's a pagan government and we're not doing it. So this was a a bone of contention between them. Anybody who refused to pay taxes was considered a traitor against Rome. But anybody who willingly paid taxes was considered suspect by the Israelite people. So they thought, we've got Jesus. We've got him trapped. Because if he says, yes, pay your taxes, then all the crowd would turn against him because he was endorsing Rome. But if he said, no, don't pay your taxes, well, then we can turn him over to Rome as somebody who is trying to incite a rebellion. So they thought they trapped him. But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius whose likeness and inscription is on it. So we have an image here of a Roman denarius that we'll put up on the screen. So this would have been the coin that they would have pulled out to to show Jesus. And just like your currency today, if I asked you to pull out a coin or a, a piece of paper currency, uh, you would see a picture of a dead uh, president. They're not all presidents, but you would see a picture of somebody who's no longer living uh, on your currency. And so they pulled out this coin and he, Jesus said, whose image is on this coin? Now, what you may not be able to read uh, is the inscription on the coin says, Theos Sabatos Kaiser, translated God Augustus Caesar. Part of the reason that the, that the Jews really hated Rome was because they came in and they made them use their coins, and their coins not only had an image of Caesar on it, but the proclamation on the coin was that Caesar is God. Caesar is Lord. 
And of course, for them, this was total blasphemy. So when Jesus said to them, whose coin is on it, he is asking them to produce a coin out of their pocket. And he's demonstrating the very hypocrisy that they are showing him by asking him, should we pay taxes or not? Because they are carrying around in their purses and in their, on their selves images of a Roman Caesar who in their own pocket, there's an inscription that says, this guy is God. So they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Now, that seems like a pretty good response. Like, okay, Jesus, rack one up for Jesus. But, but think about this for a second. What is, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, you know, you're so concerned about this coin and what you should do with this coin. Don't, don't you realize that that coin has got a picture of Caesar on it? So just give it back to Caesar. God doesn't really want your money. Where is the image of God imprinted? The image of God is imprinted on you. Like you were made in the image of God. Hey, give to God what is God's, meaning give all of who you are to God. Don't worry about the money. Give the money to Caesar. That's fine. It doesn't matter. You were created in the image of God. And so Jesus, as he's saying this, is affirming in them something so important. He's saying, look, you are worried about a dead Roman emperor who is going to be forgotten. This coin is going to be worth nothing. And God is interested in your eternal soul. They had the image of God imprinted on them. They had been created, as have you, in God's image, commanded to fill the earth with the image of the glory of God. And they had failed to live out their calling as God's image bearers. The nation of Israel had failed to go out and display the glory of God in the way they lived, in the way they interacted with God. In fact, because if there was a, Rome, a Roman government who proclaimed Caesar is Lord, the only reason the Roman government proclaimed Caesar is Lord is because Israel had failed in its mission to declare that God is Lord. You and I have been given a divine calling. Everywhere we go, the image of God goes with you. Every word you say comes forth as it comes from the image of God. And Jesus is saying, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. That's temporary. But give to God what is God. And so they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. But they weren't about to give up. Because next comes the religious question. Then they came to him, some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. Now, there were different religious sects in Judaism at this time, as you might imagine. But one of the sects was called uh, the Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They, did not, they believed once you died, that was it, everything was over. That's why they were sad, you see. That's how you can remember that. The Pharisees, however, believed that the, in the resurrection. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees on this. Jesus agreed that there was a resurrection. But the Sadducees wanted to, make this, wanted to bring up this political strife because they figured, hey, if we can nail Jesus down on this, you know, half the crowd agrees that there's a resurrection, half the crowd doesn't. Maybe if we catch Jesus in this, he'll lose half the crowd. So they're asking Jesus about this idea. Now, the Sadducees understood that later books in the Old Testament, like Jeremiah and others, did proclaim that there was a resurrection. But they would always argue that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, never talked about the resurrection. So this is a theological debate, it's kind of a, a theologically nerdy debate that people had in this day and age, and they're trying to trap Jesus on it. They, didn't, they weren't able to trap him on the taxation question, so they're going to try to get him on this religious question. And so they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, Having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. This was called the Leverite marriage law. Basically, it was a form of social safety networking that uh, because there was nothing to care for, there was no way to care for widows and, and orphans in, in that day. There was no social security or, or government to back it up. And, and women really couldn't work in this day and age. There was no way for them to, to make, a money, so, make any money. So the idea was if a, if, a woman, if a woman's husband passed away and she didn't have any children to take care of her, well, the brother of the dead man had to marry the widow 
in order for her to become his wife and then give birth to a child. And then that son, when that son would grow up, would be able to take care of the woman. That was the rule. That's the way it worked. It was a social safety network. So they're, they're concocting this story. Again, they're trying to trap Jesus in the idea of the resurrection. So this is the law. They, Jesus understood the law. They understood the law. Um, so, so now there was seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. After one word, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. We're like, man, we got him now, right? We could get him on the tax question. That was a pretty good answer, Jesus. You know, the whole image on the coin thing. But you're going to have to answer this one because this woman, you know, she's been with all seven of these men, no kids when she gets to heaven. Whose wife is she going to be? They're thinking, he's got to answer this. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to the age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels and they are the sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Now, this passage has created both angst and joy in the minds of a lot of people for a lot of years. It just depends on how much you like being married, right? If you're not so happy about being married, the idea of, hey, there's no marriage in heaven, woohoo. But if on the other hand, if you're like, hey, I like my wife pretty much and I'd like to stay married to for eternity, you're like, well, what does this mean? What is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is talking about something here that a lot of people have debated over the years, but one of the things that he is saying is that we don't fully understand what relationships are like in heaven. Come on, let's be honest. We don't understand what relationships are like on earth. So how much more are we going to, right? I mean, come on. So Jesus is saying, you guys don't really understand. Not only do you not understand what heaven is about, but he's saying, you don't really even understand what the purpose of marriage on earth is about. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. In the passage about the bush, in the passage about the bush, where he is called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, for all live in him. So Jesus is calling him out. He said, hey, you guys say that there is no resurrection in the first five books of the Old Testament. Well, you're not reading the Bible very carefully. Because remember when Moses, the writer of the first five books, remember when he's standing at the burning bush? And he calls God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you think that God is the God of the living or of the dead? And the Sadducees are like, dang it. We thought we had him on this. Guys, how could you not see this coming? Of course he's the God of the living and not the God of the dead. And so Jesus basically answers the question. Of course, you don't even understand the scriptures, Jesus said. Of course he is the God of the living. Therefore, there must be a resurrection. Because he's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any questions. <laughs> of course not. Every time they ask him questions, they end up looking like fools. Meanwhile, Jesus' popularity is only growing. His credibility among the crowd is only growing. So Jesus is going to turn the tables on him. And he's going to ask them a question. And the question that Jesus asked them gets right to the heart of who he is. You see, there was a belief among the Jews that the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, would come and he would be a descendant of the greatest king who had ever ruled over Israel, King David. That somewhere in King David's line, there would come a, a ruler who would come, who would establish the kingdom of Israel forever. And so they know this, they recognize this. And so Jesus asked them this question, but he said to them, how can they say that the Christ, which is the Messiah, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? Now, this was a mind bender for all the religious people. They're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. So if you're saying, I have no idea what that means, they didn't know what it meant either. But let me tell you what it means. It means that Jesus is saying, hey, the line of David is going to produce a Messiah. But David, when he talks about the Messiah, doesn't call the Messiah his son. He calls him his Lord, which makes absolutely no sense. How is that supposed to be fulfilled? How is that supposed to come about? See, they didn't understand the nature of the Messiah. 
They didn't understand that the Messiah wasn't just going to be a temporary earthly king who was going to restore the nation of Israel, but the Messiah was going to come to be an eternal king, Lord over all and Lord over them. They totally missed it. There are in these three questions, in these three interactions that the religious leaders have with Jesus, I think three things that we have to be careful as we're making decisions day in and day out not to confuse. The first one is this. Don't confuse the temporary with the eternal. Don't confuse the temporary with the eternal. So many times in life, the decisions we face are a decision between what is temporary and what is eternal. Look what Jesus does. The first thing he talks about, the first question he's asked are about coins. And and, and what is Jesus pointing out? He is pointing out that these coins are temporary. They come, they're issued from an empire that has long since failed with the images of kings on it who are nothing but footnotes in history books versus the eternal image of God imprinted on every human being. Jesus is saying, don't, don't confuse the temporary with the eternal here. You're too short-sighted. You guys are looking at Rome. You're looking at the coins. You're looking at the political situation. You're not looking far enough into the future. But it wasn't just about the coins. It was also about the temporary nature of human relationships. What's the second thing he's questioned on? He's questioned on this idea of marriage. And he's saying, you guys are so focused on this idea of whose wife will this woman be. And you're missing the eternal destiny, the eternal relationship that marriage is pointing to. That marriage has always been about something bigger than your temporary human relationships. Marriage has always been simply a broken signpost pointing you to the eternal relationship that God wants to have with his people, a union between God and his people that is to last forever. And marriage, as good as they may be, are nothing but temporary broken signposts pointing us to that. This is why the way we live our life with our spouse matters, Christian. Listen, you can get into all the debates and we can have all the debates about the definition of marriage and all, we can decry and, and debate all the controversy about what's going on in marriage. But listen, if just people who love Jesus said, I want my marriage to be a reflection of the hope of heaven, we would change the world. You don't need other people to understand the definition of marriage. Christians, just you understand the definition of marriage. Just you understand the purpose of marriage. It's not going to be perfect because, remember, it's at best a temporary broken signpost. But what is that temporary broken signpost pointing to? It's supposed to be pointing to to this hope, this eternal heavenly union that we have with God. A, A God who loves us, a God who will never forsake us, and that even when we have failed him time and again, even when we've been unfaithful to him, he is always faithful to us. The Apostle Paul talked about this same thing in Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. When he's talking about the marriage relationship, the husbands and wives, here's what he says. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. He's quoting from Genesis, the very foundation for marriage itself. And the two will become one flesh. And he says, this is a profound mystery to which every man ever has said amen, right? It's a profound mystery. We don't understand it. It's str- we struggle to get it. And it's it's, this idea of bringing two people together and making them one flesh. It's so complicated. It's so much beyond our ability. Listen, if if you've had marriage problems, it's because it's hard. It's because it's difficult. And God is pointing, this is the kind of union that I want with you. But I am not, but Paul goes on to say, but I'm not talking about marriage. I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and so the wife must respect her husband. He's talking about this idea that whether it's a coin and a temporary temporary coin versus the eternal image of God in humans, or whether it's the temporary marriage that's just supposed to last for one lifetime that's pointing to the eternal union we have with God, we're too short-sighted. Don't confuse the temporary with the eternal. Even when Jesus is talking about King David, King David was temporary, But the son, the Messiah who would come, Jesus who would reign, wasn't going to be a temporary king. He was going to be an eternal king. Don't confuse the temporary with the eternal. Listen, we do this all the time. I do this all the time. In so many ways, in big decisions and small, I confuse the temporary for the eternal. And I just started thinking, what happens? What happens in my life when I confuse the temporary with the eternal? Well, the first thing I thought about was, my problems all seem insurmountable. Have you ever noticed that? Whenever you confuse the temporary with the eternal, 
Your problems always seem like you can't, there's no way to get over them. There's no way to get around them. In fact, let's just do a little thought experiment with you. Think back in your life, five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long ago it was. Think back, and I guarantee if you think without, not, you don't have to think very long, but you can think back just a little ways, and you can find a problem somewhere five, 10 years ago that you thought you'd never get over it. You'd never get around it. A heartbreak, a disappointment, a pain, and you just thought at the time, you were so consumed with that, you thought, my, my life's not going to go on. And by God's grace, five, ten years later, here you are. See, when, when we confuse the temporary with the eternal, our problems seem insurmountable. I love what Psalm 8 says. When I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? <laughs> in other words, Sometimes the best thing you can do when you're facing a problem and you know it's temporary, but you are so, you're so overwhelmed with a temporary problem, sometimes the best thing you can do is go out and look up at the stars and remember that the same God who made the stars and hung them in place hundreds and thousands and billions of years ago is the same God who will still be God 100,000 billion years from now. And suddenly your problems are put in perspective. When we confuse the temporary with the eternal, our problems are bigger than they should be. This is why somebody like the Apostle Paul, who faced starvation and hunger and betrayal and beating, can say, I consider these trials a light and momentary affliction compared to the glory of heaven. I, listen, I'm not trying to make light of your problems. I, 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 I can't... I don't know and I can't imagine what you're going through in the weight of what you feel. But this isn't about that. This is about something that's bigger than your problems. That you have to believe in light of eternity, God is bigger than your temporary problems. And God's love for you is longer and stronger than whatever you're feeling, whatever feelings are being, are being evoked by your temporary problems. Jesus is saying, guys, you are so focused on these temporary issues, you need to focus on the eternal. I love the old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And the, my favorite line in that, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, if your temporary problems are overwhelming you, I would just invite you, turn your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes away from from the image on your currency and all the money problems, that's temporary. And turn your eyes to the image of the one who imprinted his image on you, Jesus Christ. The second thing I do when I confuse the temporary with the eternal is I prioritize the wrong things. Whenever you confuse the temporary with the eternal, you will always prioritize the wrong things. Look what they were doing. They were prioritizing money over people. Jesus is pointing it out. In fact, we're going to get to this more next week when Jesus really talks to them about their greed and their selfishness. They were so concerned about paying taxes that they were failing to live out their mission. They were prioritizing their money over people. But it was more than just about that. It was also about marriage. You know, this whole idea that somehow this woman, this poor widow that they were using as an illustration, whose wife would she be? In other words, who would get the benefit of having a wife in heaven? They were, they were totally missing it. Marriage is a, they were having this idea that as if marriage were about happiness rather than holiness. If marriage was about me rather than about we. Jesus is saying, you, you guys are even in your illustration using this woman as for temporary, for, for what she can do for them temporarily and you're trying to extend that into eternity. Marriage isn't about that. We prioritize the wrong things. Whenever we emphasize the temporary over the eternal, we are always going to prioritize the wrong thing. And finally, the third thing we do when we prioritize the temporary over the eternal is life become, becomes hopeless. Life becomes hopeless. Death is inevitable, which means that I will either live with no regard for other people, but only for what I can get out of this life, or I will become despondent, believing that there is no meaning in this life whatsoever. Jesus says, don't confuse the temporary with the eternal. Your problems will seem insurmountable. You'll prioritize the wrong things and life will become hopeless. But the second thing he says in all of this is don't confuse your earthly masters with your heavenly father. Don't confuse your earthly master with your heavenly father. Notice it on the coin. The earthly master was Caesar Augustus, right? 
the coin, Caesar is Lord. And Jesus is like, he can write whatever he wants on that coin. He's going to be dead. People are going to be naming their dogs after him. Like he's irrelevant. And Jesus is saying, do do not confuse your earthly master. Yeah, he may have power right now, but do not confuse your earthly master with your heavenly father. And even with the widow, what's their concern? Whose wife will she be? This was a question of who would have authority over this woman in heaven. And the answer was, none of those men were going to have authority over that woman in heaven. Because she was a creation of God himself. And she would not bow to some husband she had on earth. None of these men were going to have a relationship with beyond, beyond this life. All of these relationships were only pointing towards Jesus. Even when Jesus brought up King David, don't confuse your earthly master with your heavenly Lord. Even King David, as great as he was, understood that his authority only came, only came because of his heavenly father. And he's saying, don't confuse King David with the Messiah. Don't confuse a temporary king whose tomb we can identify with your heavenly Lord who will reign forever. What happens when I confuse my earthly master with my heavenly father? Well, first of all, I think many times we make inaccurate assumptions about God. Some of you have maybe experienced this. You have, you have had a, a bad experience with a person in authority. Maybe it was a person in church or a person who claimed to be a Christian. Maybe it was uh, parents. And, and, and somehow we project back on God the cruelty of an earthly master. A lot of people have done that. Whenever we confuse our earthly master with our heavenly father, we can make inaccurate assumptions about who God is. And it can take years and maybe even a lifetime to work through that. But but the second thing we do is we overestimate the power of our earthly masters. This is why it really worries me when Christians get too excited or too upset about whoever is in the White House or whichever party controls Congress. Like, have we forgotten that I'm not saying those things aren't important and we shouldn't give them respect, but, but you do ultimately realize that our, our eternal hope doesn't lie in a politician or a political party. It lies in the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we forget that when we confuse our earthly master with our heavenly father. And finally, he says, don't confuse the living with the dead. And maybe this is the most important thing of all. The coin with the impression of a dead emperor on it is not as important as a living person created in, the, in God's image. The Sadducees failed to care for the living widow, but would rather use her suffering as a theological point. Next week, we're going to see Jesus say in, in chapter 20, verse 47, they devour widows' houses, talking about these same religious people. In other words, you would love to use this widow as an illustration. Meanwhile, you're taking advantage of her for temporary financial gain. Don't confuse the living with the dead. They, they revered King David, And one greater than King David was standing right in front of them. In fact, the Apostle Peter said this in Acts 2.29 when he preached that great sermon. He said, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. David's tomb has a body in it. Jesus' tomb is empty. Know the difference. Know the difference. Every person printed on American currency, their body is in a tomb somewhere. But Jesus' grave is empty. Know the difference between the living and the dead. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. And Jesus is pleading with these religious leaders. Put your faith in the living God. I'm standing right in front of you. See, the religious leaders in Jerusalem had come to the tipping point. What would they choose? Would they choose, would they choose eternity over the temporary? Would they choose loyalty to their heavenly father over their temporary authority of the Roman government? Would they choose life over death? This is the choice that they had had all along. This is the choice that God had given the nation of Israel at the very beginning, thousands of years before Jesus. Listen to what he said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. And Jesus is standing before them again saying, guys, don't choose the temporary over the eternal. Coins, 
your earthly relationships, all that's temporary. It's all pointing to something else. Don't miss it. Don't, don't confuse your earthly master with your heavenly father. I'm here as a demonstration of his love for you. Don't choose the dead over the living. I've come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. C.S. Lewis basically said the same thing and he worded it this way. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. If you aim at the temporary, if you aim at the earthly masters, if you aim at that which is dead, you may get it for a brief period of time, but you won't keep it. But if you aim at heaven, if you choose life, you choose your heavenly father, you choose that which is eternal, you will get everything thrown in. This is the choice we have to make when we determine whether to follow Jesus, but it's also a decision we make each and every day. So in closing, let me just give you three quick questions for whatever decisions you're facing right now. And these questions at first may seem even ridiculous, but they, they would have changed decisions you would have made in the past, and they may change decisions you'll make in the future. The first one is this. As you're facing a decision, what will the consequence of this decision be in five, 10, 20, 1,000 years? Let me, let me tell you if, you, if you had asked that question a long time ago, you probably wouldn't have as much debt as you have right now, right? I mean, come on, there may be things you're paying on and you don't even own the thing anymore, but you still have the bill. What difference will this make in 5, 10, 15? What difference will it make in 1,000 years? This question may have prevented you from experiencing a failed marriage. We think too short term. What, what difference, what are the consequences of this decision in 5, 10, 20, 1,000 years? Second question, does my decision reflect faith in my heavenly Father? This question will give you the courage to do what fear is preventing you from doing now. Does this, faith, does this decision reflect faith in my heavenly Father, or is it motivated by fear? And finally, what does choosing life mean in this situation? What does choosing life mean in this situation? This question would have kept you from working late and missing your kid's recital and soccer game. This question would have saved the lives of millions of unborn babies. The answer to this question isn't just about life here and now. The answer to this question is about what gives you life for all eternity. What will you choose? Jesus comes and says, choose that which is eternal. Choose the love of your heavenly father who would give his life for you. Choose life over death.